Thank you very much for coming. I thought it was great to see a really good um, uh, turnout. My name is Torsten Bell. I'm the Chief Exec of the Resolution Foundation. For those of you that don't know, and if you don't know, I'm even more impressed that you turned up. <laughs> uh, the Resolution Foundation is a, a small economics research institute focused on raising the living standards of households on low and middle incomes. Those of you that like numbers rather than euphemisms, that means people earning less than 30k. They are in um, short. And we're here because over the last two and a half years, um, basically since we were allowed out of our houses to free ourselves from <laughs> homeschooling and the other troubles. We've been working on a big project about the future of the UK economy called the Economy 2030 Inquiry. You all got a free book at the back. Please take them if you haven't already because I don't want to take them home on the train. <laughs> but also because they're good. So you speak. And it's asking, why do we all feel like it's not going very well? Not in your personal lives, I'm sure they are, but in terms of the British economy, what's our underlying diagnosis of the problem? And then what do we start doing about that? How do we understand what our strengths are and our weaknesses, but not just the weaknesses, it's good to focus on some strengths. And then what are we going to do about it? And as we're going to set out in a second, in a, in a minute, Hannah's going to, Hannah Sorter here is a senior economist at the Resolution Foundation, going to give a very, very brief, I know when you're looking at the book and you're like, is she actually going to give a presentation of the book? <laughs> and everyone wants to end it now. Uh, she's not going to do that. She's going to give some very high level headlines because the main point of today's event isn't what is everything we need to know about sorting out the British, the national economy, but where does West Yorkshire fit into that picture? And maybe in that respect we're obviously interested to listen to people on this panel and then all of you in the discussion afterwards about where does West Yorkshire fit in? Where do you feel like you know things are similar to what needs to happen at the national level and where do you feel like actually it's different? And there will definitely be differences. There are in every part of the um, country, so we're here to listen. And to help us do that, you're first of all going to hear from, I think you all know her, but if you get injured, you not, you just voted for her, just statistically. <laughs> I'm not saying you're biased, I'm just saying statistically most of you voted for her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, you can hear from Tracy uh, Revan, the, um, and then after her speech, which is basically setting out, well, I'll let you tell it, but setting out her view about where where Shorter fits into this, mainly from an economic perspective. You're going to hear from two other great speakers. You're Kirsten England, who has done every job there ever was. Um, I found out some extra ones today. I didn't think I could find out any new ones, but I did find out some new ones uh, just now. But she's the chair of the Bradford Culture Company, so it's very quiet at the moment, obviously. Um, but is also, from a think tank perspective, chair of the Young Foundation down in London, which is a much kind of hipper, cooler think tank of the Resolution Foundation, and that is saying something, because we are pretty uh, hip and cool. And then you're going to hear from Rosina Breed, who I first met a long time ago when she was foolishly uh, part of a large uh, conglomerate known as the BBC, um, but now she runs the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, which I've also just learned is in Shoreditch. So she's also oh, hip and cool, cool, like the cool. Foundation, but she lives in Leeds, it's okay, everyone. It's okay. Uh, yeah. So that's the plan, and then we're going to have time for a discussion with um, all of you, and we allegedly we're going to finish at 6.30. I'm just nudging the panel here, because I know that I'm basically, I'm the gender balance, right, today, because you can't have a single sex panel. So that's the only reason I get invited. <laughs> Fine. They're, but they all need to stick to time, because otherwise we won't finish. Yeah. Right, with that warning, Hannah, what's in your presentation that isn't the whole book, because we promised you? <laughs> Thanks, Wilson. Um, I will try and be, uh, give you a very condensed version of the book. Um, but I'm going to start with talking about the problem and why did we write this book in the first place. Um, and that is because we are over a decade into an economic stagnation, which this chart is showing you. Uh, the red line is GDP per capita, uh, which uh, the growth rate was kind of relatively high for most of the 70s, 80s, 90s, and then it's kind of fallen off a cliff, uh, particularly over the last uh, 15 years. And why does that matter? Um, most tangibly because the blue line, uh, which is wages, has uh, wage growth has fallen along with it. So all of our living standards are being uh, stagnating and not growing as much as they have been in the past. But not only do we have low growth, which is a very recent problem, we also are living with the legacy of high inequality. So this chart is showing you one of the measures of inequality, which is the Gini coefficient, but basically we started off um, around 25, um, and its uh, inequality rose during the 80s in particular, um, but has stayed stubbornly high since. So we are not only a slow growth economy, but also a very unequal one. Uh, and that matters because uh, it means that today it's, the UK is a particularly bad place to be poor. It means that 
uh, our, the, the living standards of our poorest people are far below those of comparative countries like France and Germany uh, by about uh, a quarter. So this is a big problem. What do we do about it? Um, I'm sure we'll hear from the rest of the panel kind of, uh, lots of ideas, particularly around how uh, West Yorkshire plays into this, but some of our thoughts from our research. Um, one, to, to kind of start with the growth angle, um, and, and there's a lot of charts I can show you about kind of uh, how we get growth going again, um, but given that today we're talking about um, the local areas of West Yorkshire, this chart is showing you uh, what the picture looks like from our uh, cities. So this, this chart is showing you along the horizontal axis, uh, graduates as a share of the workforce in each of our cities, each bubble is a city, uh, and on the vertical axis, what's happening to output the job. And as you can see, the more graduates you have generally, the more productive you are, the more the higher your output for each job. Uh, although the, the kind of, you need a lot more graduates to get a, lot, a little bit more productive. But the, the point I want to make here is you can see uh, slightly faintly up in the uh, top right hand corner is London, uh, where there's a lot of graduates uh, and they're very productive. Um, but most of our big cities, most of our other big cities are far less productive and, and that's partly because they have fewer graduates, although uh, there's kind of lots of factors at play. And I've highlighted that in red, uh, we've got Bradford, uh, which is down towards uh, the left um, hand side, and Leeds, which is slightly further up, but uh, it's kind of still uh, far behind London. So, uh, and, and that's really important because lots of the country lives in uh, big cities like Leeds and Bradford and like some of the other ones that are there. Um, and without getting those growing again, we can't lift the living standards of the whole country. And this chart is illustrating a kind of, you know, it, it, this is quite uniquely a UK phenomenon. So I've just put here the UK at the top and then France just as one example um, at the bottom. And you can see at, um, at the top of the UK, we've got kind of London. Uh, this is kind of ordered by. Um, how productive, again, uh, each city is. London is really productive, and then all the other, uh, most of the other large cities lag behind. And that's not the case in France, where you've got Paris, yes, being much more productive than the other cities, but you've got Lyon, Toulouse, other big cities that aren't that far behind it. So we have kind of a model from other countries um, to kind of uh, close that gap between uh, cities uh, with the capital. I mean, um, the, Different cities, of course, have different strengths. We're not suggesting that every large city needs to be like London. Um, and this chart is just showing you the different uh, kind of employment makeup of Bradford, Leeds, and then all of um, the cities uh, kind of average uh, on the right hand side. Um, and I think one takeaway from this chart is is that different yeah, diff different cities have different strengths. So Bradford, you can see on the left hand side. Uh, has more manufacturing uh, than average, so those are the kind of bottom red and blue bars, uh, and less um, kind of uh, services, um, but with a quite a large uh, public sector. Leeds looks a bit more similar to the average um, um, that you can see there. Um, and you know that's that's always going to be the case. Different cities have different uh, kind of legacies from from what's happened in the past. Um, but what we do know is that the UK's comparative strength is in uh, is in knowledge-based services, which is what uh, this uh, chart is showing. So part of getting um, part of getting the UK kind of growing again is about supporting those services sectors, and that doesn't just mean kind of you know, financial services and banks. This is kind of lots of different sectors um, across the economy. But this is kind of a lesson for where we have um, kind of a lot of um, kind of room to, to to kind of build on what we're good at already. Um, and so one of our national um, uh, recommendations for getting growth going again is very much about boosting investments. And this chart is showing you uh, investment as a share of GDP, uh, the kind of shaded area is uh, selected advanced economies, kind of the range that we see um, in the UK, you can see the red line is quite uh, near the bottom. Uh, so we definitely need to be boosting our uh, investments and that's not just uh, business investment, it's also public investment. Of course, investing in, uh, in public investment as well as boosting public services, which is um, obviously also really important, uh, requires uh, public spending. Um, and so we've got proposals set out in the book um, to how to reform the tax system to do that, uh, but not just by kind of taxing people more, but by taxing people better um, and kind of making sure that uh, the tax burden uh, falls um, where 
on the people who can most afford it. But growth isn't the only thing that we need to sort out. So our cities also face uh, big challenges with inequality. So this is just one illustration of that. This is showing, uh, you can see at the bottom, we've just got England uh, as a whole there, uh, which is the gap in uh, the share of people's uh, GCSE getting grades five or above in English and maths. Uh, and that's the difference between uh, those who are eligible for free school meals um, on, the, on the left-hand side and other children on the right-hand side. So there's a big gap there, basically. Um, it, you know, the children from more deprived backgrounds are less likely to get those um, GCSEs at grade five and above. Uh, and here I'm showing you um, what that looks like across different cities. And I mean, different uh, different cities have different challenges. Um, kind of Leeds, uh, which I've highlighted there, um, looks fairly similar again to, to England as a whole, with lots of inequality uh, there. Bradford's challenge is slightly different. There's less inequality. Those kind of data points are, are a bit closer together, um, but fewer children overall are getting those um, those grade um, grade five and above in English and maths. So there's, there's, that's just one illustration of the inequality that, that we uh, need to solve. And to do that and get serious about inequality, there's lots of, again, lots of things outlined in the book about how we can do that. But one, um, one way of doing that is through a strong safety net. So this is uh, the, sh the value of unemployment benefits um, as a share of um, earnings, which you can see has basically been falling steadily since the 1970s. Benefits have been upgraded in, in line with prices, but not in line with average earnings. So that means that when we've had growth, um, the gains haven't been equally shared. So one way of uh, kind of addressing inequality is to relink uh, unemployment benefits uh, to, um, to earnings. But it's also about improving security in the labour market, yeah, getting good jobs out there for people, um, especially for low paid workers. Part of that is through the minimum wage, part of that is through um, other employment rights to improve stability. Um, and, and that means that the, you know, when, when we have growth, the gains can be truly shared across the population. So just finally, before I pass over uh, to Tracy for, for kind of, uh, her take on, on what next um, for West Yorkshire, what, what can we gain from this? Uh, so the UK can, be, can plausibly become both richer and more equal. So this chart is showing you inequality along uh, the horizontal axis um, and um, average income per capita on the vertical axis. And the UK is in the middle there. And there are lots of countries in that kind of top left quadrant uh, which are both richer and more equal than us, including places like Canada, Germany, Australia, the Netherlands, France. So this isn't kind of a pipe dream that we're saying, you know, we can just somehow become, uh, you know, fast growing and less equal, and, and you know, that's uh, what will become kind of an international outlier. This is very much a case of kind of moving towards countries that we often see as our peers. And just to put a number on that, uh, the the. The average UK household would be £8,300 a year richer if we were to move closer to uh, some of those countries that I highlighted there. So there's a big kind of prize available for doing this. And I think that's it for me. Um, but yeah, we're looking forward to this discussion. Notice she was on time. Yeah, I hope everyone listening uh, took away that the country stuff that doesn't need to be. <laughs> because if these events are better, there's a bit of audience engagement. So, I'm going to reiterate that doesn't make us rest or anything. Um, how much richer is the average yak than the average Brit today? Come on, this is YouTube. Otherwise, it isn't an audience interaction if you don't, if you don't interact. Loads. Loads. <laughs> not, not helpful. The front, in a shock the move. The guy button. in the front is not helpful. <laughs> Anyone else got a better guess than loads? 20%. 20%, right. Good. Well, anyone want to go above 20? I'm looking at that chart, it seems a bit Oh, good. Oh, That's what I like. That is the kind of man I like. You looked at the chart, you read the numbers. What's the answer then? Come on. I would say getting towards 50%. 50%. Anyone lower? Let's let them right. We're going to take 50%. Everyone put their hands up if they think it's lower than 50%. Right. Hands up if you think it's higher than 50%. I just want to say, I'm just proud of those of you that were bold and went against the majority there. <laughs> you clearly voted, the majority of you clearly voted for under 50%. The answer is 60%. Mm -hmm. You get double points, sir. Uh, you led the room there, but they did not follow you. <laughs> <laughs> With that, over to Trace. <laughs> Thanks so much, and honestly, Hannah, that was great, and um, we do have a copy of the book in the office. 
Um, thank <laughs> you so much for the introduction and honestly thank you to the Resolution Foundation for enabling me to come this evening and to see so many friends and familiar faces in the audience. This is my first opportunity to speak in public since I was elected. So this speech is going to be chunky, guys. <laughs> so if you need to use the loo or you feel a bit faint or you need another drink, I won't be offended if you get up. Um, but I was very proud of where we ended up with 7.4% increase in my share of the vote and the biggest swing to Labour in any mayoral election this year. Honestly, don't we have a mandate for change? We really do. So I'm very proud about that. Because it, it's become so clear that no matter people's politics, everyone is desperate for change, for a better and more hopeful future. Now, the last three years of being your mayor were incredible. Delivering on those original 10 manifesto pledges to the public, all of them, every single one delivered, but also putting the foundations in place so we can motor on to the second term. And the message I've now given my team is deliver, deliver, deliver on bus franchising, on mass transit, on a region of learning and creativity, on transforming our economy, creating those jobs and those opportunities, and putting more money in people's pockets. Thank you to Hannah for that presentation because what you present, the problem, the decade of stagnation, it's all too real, isn't it, for the people of Bradford and right across West Yorkshire. And the statistic I'm always struck by is that this will be the first parliament in modern history to actually see a fall in living standards. I mean, that's quite incredible and shaming. And it was Ronald Reagan who famously asked the electorate, if they were better off today than you were four years ago during the 1980s US presidential election, <coughs> And no surprise that Rachel Reeves is asking that very same question in 2024. Now, you don't need to be brain of Britain to decipher what the opinion polls are telling us about the answer to that question. And here in West Yorkshire, things are no different to what they are in the rest of the country. Despite the size of our economy, our productivity growth has not kept pace with the rest of the UK, which is having a real impact on living standards. Now, we've seen an increase in economic inactivity driven by people taking care of others and a widening of health inequality. Too many people in our region don't have the right qualifications or skills to enable them to achieve or to thrive. But what we do have here in Bradford and in West Yorkshire is a determination to address those challenges head on. When I was re-elected, I held that promise to focus on growing a more inclusive economy with more jobs, more opportunities spread across the region. I've committed to producing a local growth plan, which is already underway, setting out how we'll enable, support and deliver a growing regional economy over the next decade. And I was really delighted to be able to discuss this with uh, this work with a future Labour government, with Keir Starmer, Rachel Reeves, Angela Rayner, and fellow Labour mayors at an, uh, <clears throat> at an event earlier this week. And we've seen today, haven't we, that Labour have announced their steps for change with their pledge card, including that crucial commitment to deliver economic stability so we can grow our economy. The first mission of our West Yorkshire plan was to create a brighter West Yorkshire that works for all creating a prosperous region with inclusive economy, with more well-paid jobs and opportunities. Now, we are only going to succeed in that mission if people answer yes to the Reagan and the Reeves question in four years' time. To do that, we really need to understand where the opportunities for growing our economy are and what do we need to do to support them because our economy is not dominated by a single sector. Now, while some might see this as a weakness, I would argue that it's actually an incredible strength, providing resilience and broader opportunity. All of those different sectors sat side by side, creating the opportunities for new and innovative businesses. Manufacturing still plays a significant employment role for us, with specialisms in textiles, and here in the Bradford district, some amazing businesses developing components for aerospace, satellites, even space rockets. So whilst I can understand, I'm looking at you, Tolston, while some might argue there is unlikely to be a manufacturing renaissance across the UK, its importance to our local economy should not be underestimated. We're leaders in financial and professional services, with the sector now growing in Bradford and Halifax, as well as the historic base in Leeds, helping to drive a strong knowledge economy. 
As a global lead in healthcare technology, a strong digital ecosystem, all in underpinned by excellent universities and colleges, and it's great to see Bradford University here, with our seven universities producing 35,000 graduates annually. Crucially, we have a diverse and growing population that can transform the region's future, no more so than here in this city, with one of the youngest urban populations in the whole of Europe. So despite the challenges we face, the future is looking bright for our region, proving devolution is working. But we know there's so much more we have to do if we're going to achieve our ambitions, if we're going to put more money, as we've seen, into people's pockets. We have got to nurture our clusters that have high growth potential and attract new specialisms to the region. We know we've opportunities in emerging tech, disrupting traditional industries in fintech, legal tech and medtech. In advanced manufacturing centred on engineering, food tech and production, machinery and textiles, in the creative industries, film and TV production, and in our ambitions to achieve net zero in clean tech, construction and water and waste. We must, as we've heard, boost the number of businesses exporting, increase the number of innovative and high growth firms, which will need a greater level of public and private investment, and of course that commitment over a long period. So it's up to all of us as place leaders to create a supportive environment that can allow businesses to attract investors. Now one big piece of the jigsaw, and I'm sure you all feel my pain, is transport. It's one of the reasons why I committed to bringing the bosses back into public control and why I'm focused on delivering the franchise bus network everywhere in West Yorkshire and why I'm committed and determined to spades in the ground on mass transit by 2028 with the first consultation launching next month with our plans to connect the centres of Leeds and Bradford. That will enable more of the 1.3 million people who live in those two cities to travel between them more easily, opening up those opportunities for regeneration and development. Now, it's part of a much wider plan to make the centre of Bradford more connected, more livable. Now, I can imagine the work in and around the city centre hasn't gone unnoticed. <laughs> but sadly, to make progress, there does have to be disruption. And Bradford is ambitious. The delivery of One City Park, the major new Grade A office space in the heart of the city, secured PwC as an anchor tenant. Bradford Live, Darley Street Market, renovation of the Alhambra, Media Museum, the work to transform how people move around, all demonstrate the level of confidence the council and the CA have in the city. Together, we're creating a calmer, safer, more attractive city centre to attract that private centre sector investment. And when you add in the amazing towns in the north of the district, when I call them up, put your hand up if you live here, in Ilkley, in Shipley, in Bingley, Saltaire, Keithley, all of these amazing vibrant places to live with, with great connections to Bradford and Leeds. And it's little surprise that they are reckoned to be some of the best places to live in the north. And Bradford is honestly the place to be. And I don't need to tell anybody in this room about the buzz around City of Culture 2025. The eyes of the nation are going to be on us, attracting visitors from all over the country and beyond. But all of this is just the beginning, with plans for a new rail station, putting Bradford on the main line for the first time. We won't have to reverse out. We'll be finally <laughs> connecting our young, talented people to the opportunities they deserve and truly unlock Bradford's economic growth potential. The rail investment is the precursor to those plans around the Southern Gateway, unlocking developments we all want to see, the thousands of new city centre homes in the form of Bradford City Village. It truly is our time. But we are a region of multiple cities and towns, Leeds, Wakefield, Halifax, Huddersfield, as well as Bradford, all with their different characters and specialisms. But the transport plan we have is designed to connect us, to drive our economy. So the opportunity anywhere in West Yorkshire is for anyone in West Yorkshire. And that's why I committed in my re-election to create a region of learning, reforming our skill system to support people to get the knowledge that they need to succeed with a modular system of learning tailored to the needs of employers and learners, along with the creation of a West Yorkshire Promise, an employer accredited badge 
to help learners demonstrate they have got the soft skills needed for the workplace. And there's 90,000 people who've benefited from our adult education funding, including an extra 7,000 low-wage workers able to access learning because we changed the criteria from those earning the minimum wage to the real living wage. 7,000 more people able to get better paid jobs. Developing rapid uh, training programs to meet employer demand for bus drivers, telecoms engineers, digital health and care sector. That is devolution right there, making a difference that benefits real people. Better transport, better skills, more livable city centres. And for you, you're all really clever, bright folk. You know that's fairly standard plan for local growth, getting the basics right, if you will. But our ambitions go further. I don't just want to grow the economy. We've got to make sure growth benefits the greatest number of people. Now, I mentioned earlier about inactivity in our region being higher than average, driven by those caring responsibilities. Childcare's role in our economy is pivotal both in the sense of supporting children in early, early learning, helping them develop, but also supporting mums and dads, getting them back into the workplace, helping to bring more cash into households. The economic benefits of investment in early years are proven. We know the Labour Party in 1997 got it, and that's why Sure Start was introduced. I don't need to tell you in this room the incredible impact that had and the IFS research that found that children eligible for free school meals, as we've seen, living near Sure Start, increased their performance at GCSE by three grades, relative to similarly poor children who were not able to access Sure Start. When I was the Shadow Early Years Minister, I championed Sure Start, and when I became Mayor, I was excited about the funding in our devolution deal to the ACT Early Institute, right here in Bradford, which focuses on work to address child poverty through policy interventions. You may all know uh, Professor John Wright, who also chairs the West Yorkshire Scientific Advisory Group. I've tasked him with helping me develop evidence-based policy in this region, supporting our thinking about how we deliver public services locally. Now we know West Yorkshire's councils have an incredible record in protecting, uh, in protecting early intervention programmes despite the cuts over the last 14 years. Leeds have the Children's Centre um, as a child-friendly city, Bradford the Best Start for Life programme, Wakefield team around the school supporting families and carers, Kirklees Fresh Futures supporting children but being a community anchor. Many of these services have maintained the ethos of the original Sure Start, supporting children, supporting families from a place in the community. But I think the deeper devolution that we are negotiating with government, this government and the next, provides us with a unique opportunity to take that further. A single departmental style funding settlement with control over employment support, adult skills, a close partnership with local authorities and a health system committed to early intervention and support. I am confident we can work together to reform local public services and build a new vision for how we're supporting children and families in a modern West Yorkshire. And it's a plan that's in lockstep with Bridget Phillipson's proposals to boost child development and, and provide the best start to every child, those breakfast clubs in primary schools. But that's also alongside my ambition to support the thinking of young children and expand libraries in primary schools. I think there's a real sense we can achieve something different. Now, I am not saying it is not going to be hard and I'm not saying we can do it instantly, but what an amazing opportunity through devolution to do things better, to learn from what worked in the past and transform the way in which childcare, <coughs> employment support, adult skills training, health services and much more are, de are really designed and with the person at the centre, securing the best outcome for the individual, for their family and the community and the wider economy. So that's my plan. A plan for local growth over the next 10 years that supports businesses to grow, that creates jobs and opportunities but also changes lives by putting more money in people's pockets to end the stagnation we've seen in living standards across our region and beyond. 
But honestly, we can only deliver this by working in collaboration and partnership. And I am so looking forward to working with every single person in this room and beyond to create that brighter, more prosperous West Yorkshire that's going to work for all. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. People say that politicians don't keep their promises. But Tracy said to me, 16 minutes, and that was 15. <laughs> 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 delivery, who says the Labour government doesn't deliver? <laughs> uh, we're we're going to find out. Anyway, uh, Kirsten, you're next up. Yeah, I've been through that. Yeah, and I have an added incentive because it's my grandson's fifth birthday today. Oh, I'm late oh, to his birthday oh, party, so... Thank you even more. No, exactly, thank you even more. And I mean, follow that, basically. But um, what I'm going to try and do is just kind of tease out some of what I think actually Tracy was saying, which is, for me, and this is channeling Michael Young, you cannot have economic growth without attending to social, economic and environmental kind of prosperity. And I think you were talking about all of those things. And if I was to nuance a bit more your work, it would be to... Even to, more nuanced. Just, you know, it's implicit, I think, in the Resolution Foundation's work, but because it's written by economists, of course, no, no offence, I think it's lacking some of the kind of um, emphasis around what unleashes social capital, human capital and productivity. And I think Tracy was talking about some of that. I'm just going to mention some of the things um, related to that. But I also want to say, I think um, unlocking productivity in the UK has to be combined with the renewal of a social contract. Again, I'm thinking about Michael Young and that right relationship between citizen, state and business. And I think that there needs to be a fundamental reset and a move from the kind of consumer and transactional state to the relational state and a much more transformational relationship. And I think you point to that in your piece about workers working in the kind of um, kind of relationship with employers and the fact that productivity could be better if there was more pressure downwards and upwards around investment. So just to point to all of those things. Um, the thing that just hits me between the eyes really is that we haven't had an integrated strategy around children. And Tracy, you talked about that um, in, your, in, in your presentation. Um, I think we urgently need to rethink childhood and ensure that our children, who are the workers of the future, actually are getting the right to start in life. And, and right now, despite everything we're doing, that is evidently not so when we're hitting five million children living in poverty. Um, and when you look at the um, impact of COVID, six months to a year behind, uh, from the poorest, most deprived communities, and I mean, you point to the statistics on achievement of children on free school meals. Well, the other factor of this is 28% of the primary school kids on free school meals are persistently absent. 40% 40% of secondary school kids. Now, go figure um, where we're going to be if we cannot get around that, that issue. The school estate is crumbling and the curriculum, I mean, and, and I know many teachers are working incredibly hard, but the curriculum is not equipping our children for the future. Uh, it's lagging, you know, and, and examination boards, regulation, uh, it's not focused on the right thing. So I think it's a huge, huge issue. And I'm completely with Gordon Brown around scrapping the um, cap on two children cat. I think that was, sorry to say, but a real misstep for this country. And um, speaking from a district where there are a larger number of large families, we can absolutely see the impact on that. And completely um, with the sure start. I would accompany that by saying there hasn't been a systematic focus on community enterprise and the social fabric and infrastructure of community. That, you know this, because I've talked to you before, about hyper-local infrastructure for growth which um, connects people to opportunity. Um, and, you know, SRB, I don't want to reinvent all of New Labour, don't get me wrong, but um, I know when you look at Bradford, the areas that had asset-owning organisations created as a result of that investment, that are now driving revenues from that investment, and have the spaces in which there are, you know, there's childcare provision, there are skills provision, there are start-up businesses, particularly for women, and we've got a huge issue in this district about economic inactivity of women. Um, and we've got desiccated community infrastructure in some places. We're doing some, we've done some really interesting work to look at layers of data around social infrastructure. But, it, you know, no, sure, sure a lot. if you were to look at some of the housing estates, far from housing estates of our places, and one bus route in and out, they're lucky if they've still got a primary school there, the church is limping along, maybe, um, and the retail, centre is boarded up and you know you trade through bars if you want to buy things. Now 
I think that is a really significant issue that does need to be looked at because that's the beginning of the journey to economic um, activity. Um, something that uh, is already um, happening is that the poorest people are paying the cost of the transition to uh, net zero and are unable to kind of um, participate in a, in a market economy which has a premium on that transition, whether it's the ground source, air source, where it's the electric vehicles, um, you know, the diesel cars are at discount rates, so if that's you want the car, that, you know, if you're a poor family, um, and I think the 40% of the poorest are going to be the furthest left behind in the transition. So I mean, it's something that the Young Foundation has written a lot about, that actually we need to, um, that, that needs to be the right regulation incentives and investment, really, by government to enable that transition to happen. Um, so those are, you know, some things, because I agree fundamentally with um, the work. These are things I would particularly highlight and nuance because I'm, you know, passionate about regional inequality and spatial inequality and um, contributed to the Inclusive Growth um, Commission, which in fact you did as well, I think you might, um, which Stephanie Flanders chairs. And I think some of that we, we could do well to look at again, and I know you referenced some of that. Um, you've talked a lot about... Um, I mean, I would just, as a pass on to talking briefly about Brad, would say, um, I don't necessarily agree with all that the Prime Minister said about the, the you know, dangerous times we're in. I think it is going to have a huge impact on productivity, economic growth, disruption of markets, supply chains, um, you know, uh, migration of peoples, and that is going to distort and affect our economic growth in very particular ways. That we, and I know you started the Commission looking at Brexit in particular is a disruptive impact on COVID, um, but uh, that the geopolitical situation, climate, environment, AI, um, it, it tends to emphasise what you're saying about our expertise as part of the set, sort of section of the knowledge economy, doesn't it? Because it, that's something you can trade. But if China do start to control the minerals for the automotive industry, uh, you'll figure it's a real problem. Um, coming to Bradford, and, and Tracy has said a lot on, and very, um, you know, important things about Brad, that yes, young, diverse, globally connected and entrepreneurial, but deeply deprived in many dimensions. Um, and, uh, you know, absolutely needs to be at the heart um, of ending stagnation and growing productivity across the country. I always say you can't have a successful North without successful Brad, but we are just too big to overlook. And we are the labour force of the next generation because we, we can supply and retire in labour markets per team. Tracy has mentioned, so I'll be very quick because I do want to hear from Rosine as well. We have, we do have, and I think it's referenced here, some of the higher value add manufacturing sectors, satellite tech. We've got a real cluster around RF radio frequencies, and surely is or was here, where um, absolutely the university is supporting. Um, we have skill and strengths around cyber and AI. More postgraduate students um, of AI in Bradford University than anywhere else. Uh, wooden technology, many of these things relate to our past in textiles and engineering, specialist fabrics. Mm -hmm. Who knew that most of the um, extreme weather gear for the Norwegian military are produced in Silsden, for example. Because, you know, those are important things because they are specialist fabrics, so they've got higher value add. But also chemicals and continuing the motor automotive supply chain. We used to say, John, who's at the back, John, John from Keith Lake, sort of, um, that, you know, um, that 80% uh, of the cars in the world had a part in them that was made in Keith Lake, five miles from the centre of Keith Lake, right? So we are, not we don't have a product, but we're a supply chain economy. Um, yet, you talked about PwC making Bradford its growth hub, uh, professional financial services, and, of course, we're very strong in food manufacturing. The, country's largest food manufacturer is located here at Morrison's, which is the largest food manufacturer. Um, as Tracy um, has said, the council, of course I was tuned to until recently, but not speaking as that, just to be clear, uh, the, the council and the combined authority, it's real big focus being skills education, transport, culture, placemaking. And I, I do just, you know, this is a point about this strategy as well. We have a fantastic university in this uh, city which is number one in the country for social mobility, 10th in the world for career prospects for its graduates. Um, very strong in health tech, health and innovation and AI, but facing precarious financial circumstances because of the vagaries of government policy around uh, it, you know, visas, essentially, having not uprated the, the home fees. You know, 
we are looking at amalgamations and mergers of not brothers, can you just say that, you know, of universities potentially. Reassuring for the names of stuff. No, 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 it's not. <laughs> but it's just, it's, you know, that's the stark reality at the point that we're trying to pivot more into exactly. the knowledge economy. It's hugely important. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about skills and the work we do for 14 to 19 year olds against all of the sectors of our economy. Of course, the BRICS school is coming. Um, which will be very important in terms of the legacy of city of culture and the kind of um, range of occupations in the creative sector. And you did reference, um, Tracy, the Education Alliance for Life Chances Act early, doing incredibly important work around childhood development and, um, well, including the uh, groundbreaking Age of Wonder programme funded 10 million, funded by Welcome to look at adolescent development, which is incredibly important. <coughs> Trace has already referenced much of the transport stuff. Sorry, they have the places dug up. Um, we should though mention, shouldn't we, the hydrogen plant that we are working on as part of the transition, given that the buses, electric buses, can't get up the hills. So it's that hydrogen has to be part of our thinking. And the city centre heat network. We had the first charging clean air zone in the country. Why is that related to productivity? Because actually it was damaging the lives of children and, and adults in our inner city um, communities. Um, so, let me just talk very quickly about city culture. I've got another six minutes. Yeah. You're all right. Just do one just minute. Do, do one minute. minute. City culture. It's going to be really so, good. It is. <laughs> so, I would completely agree with the people who say city culture is not a silver bullet. It does not transform your city over It has to sit in the context of all of the other things we've been talking about. Long-term placemaking, sector development, transport and so on. However, um, one of the things that an economist did teach me once is confidence is the only thing that drives economic growth, confidence <laughs> and success. And this place has been down on itself for too long, and the country has been down on it for too long. So it is our, our opportunity to step forward, to reposition the understanding of the Bradford district, um, and to increase the prospects for inward investment, whether that is parents sending their kids to study here because they get fantastic education, whether it's tourism visitors, whether it's businesses, coming to look at here, whether it is equity investment that might come north, which is like hen's teeth as we know, but all of those things. It will be a fantastic year. It is just the fifth year of a 10 year cultural journey. I think that's really important. It's not just a one off, big bang, great, let's all have a great time, which we will, but it will lead to further investment in infrastructure, programming, uh, business development. Um, and uh, I'm delighted to be chairing the organization that will deliver it. Great. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm glad to be reassured that there will be a good time. Yeah. In the middle of the ten years, I'm, you know, we're looking forward to turning up for that. One of the things both of you raised on the is on the young people. Yeah. I was really going to stay on the um, the share of teenagers in Britain now reporting that they're skipping at least one meal yeah. a week is 11 11 percent, so one in ten for, for, for financial reasons. In Portugal. Which is a very nice country, but it's a lot poorer than us. It's 2.6%. Uh, that's how big the gap has got, and it's much larger in places like Bradford. It goes around. Uh, so, just to bring yeah. it down a bit. Um, let's see, over to you to pick us back up again. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the line in. Um, I'm the interloper in the room. I'm a journalist. So, um, you'll get something a bit different from me. And I'm a former radio producer, so I won't crash the pips. Um, <laughs> the Bureau is an independent, local to global, um, public interest investigative newsroom. We hold power to account. Um, and we're also an impact model newsroom, so we go, we go beyond the headline. To, uh, the headlines drive real world change. So those things really matter in, in the space. Um, before this role, um, I guess for some context, I was head of North for the BBC. I was head of news at Five Live, that's the largest network newsroom outside of London. Um, I was editor at BBC Radio Leeds and launched a hyperlocal called My Bradford, which was a citizen-led um, Tumblr site, and I'm chair of the board at Leeds Playhouse. So I have a sort of um, uh, an investment and a passion and a commitment to the North, and we have just actually had uh, about a third of our team um, training at Leeds Trinity uh, this week, uh, training their uh, MA students in investigative journalism. I was really thinking about what makes a good economy um, and not being an economist. Um, in my view, a better Britain is around confidence, so to the point that um, Kirsten was talking about employment, transparency, accountability. 
citizenship and an engaged as opposed to a polarised civic space and also trust in public institutions including politics. Um, journalism I think has the power to contribute to all of those things and here are sort of five key thoughts really. The power of local journalism is essential in any geographic location uh, for the confidence reasons that um, Kirsten mentioned, how people hear themselves, see themselves, who is holding to account at a local level, um, contributing to trust in public institutions, um, holding power to account, and also journalism is the bedrock uh, for functioning and transparent democracy at local level as well as national level. Um, and some of you may know that newsrooms are facing economic implosion. So again, Kirsten pointed to um, uh, the sort of economic crisis in HE. It's happening in every sector. Um, but for local journalism, REACH, for example, announced 450 job losses at the end of the year. I think in the States, you have newsrooms closing um, at a rapid rate. So local journalism needs investment. Um, uh, otherwise, you know, I mean, if you follow what happened in America in the election of Trump, many people talked about local news deserts contributing to a kind of gaps in knowledge and people following their echo chambers. Um, the second is I would sort of really, having come from a major broadcaster, I would be asking where the major broadcasters are. Um, in the city. I know there is good activity and well-meaning, um, but Bradford is the largest city uh, without a BBC um, base. Um, uh, Channel 4 could have had a studio here. Um, the BBC's total GVA in the North West, so that was particularly around Media City, was £453 million in 2019 and 2020. That was pre-recent expansion. So it supports, you know, a national broadcaster can support the local economy. Um, and my view is a national strategy needs to support local talent, contribute to confidence, a voice, uh, and representation and opportunity. And Bradford is a really entre entrepreneurial city. I mean, I, I, I think it's more entrepreneurial than Leeds, so lucky Tom Reardon isn't in the room. Um, um, yeah, I do. I'll text him them. Um, <laughs> you know, BCB, um, the Lit Festival, there are so many ways that this city is entrepreneurial and I think it doesn't wear its, um, I, does, I don't think it wears its coat confidently enough, really. Um, the third is infrastructure. So, uh, to Tracy's point, um, it's quicker for me to commute from Leeds to London than it was from Leeds to Salford. Leeds to Salford was pretty much two hours plus on a good day, um, door to door, um, one way. So getting on an LNER is, um, you know, two hours, it's, it's, um, it's, it's fabulous. But services are being cut, bus services are being cut, Train prices are extortionate. <clears throat> I was speaking to a colleague, a former colleague who lives in Manchester, works in London. His annual train cost is 18 grand a year. Mm -hmm. It's fine if you've got the job that can manage that. Um, so in invariably, there is talent lost to the south. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, you know that is having an impact on economic um, uh, economic value but also the creative knowledge base so you know back to the entrepreneurial spirit there is little point in um, creating uh, great young people if they are more likely to think I've got better opportunities especially in my sector better opportunities in London um, I've worked in London ad hoc I'm really you know my kids are older now I'm lucky to have a hands-on husband but it, you know, you navigate a career based on where it's sometimes where you have to go and the kind of, um, you know, what what really matters. And also, interestingly, the economic benefit of east-west, west-east transport far outweighs the projected benefits of HS2, which was meant, which um, uh, uh, and sort of at a far lower cost. So, you know, everything points south uh, in terms of institution decision making. Um, infrastructure, but the but the you know Transpennine is a major unlock. Um, number four is cr uh, careers in the creative sector also need creation and investment, um, and also showcasing. I absolutely believe it starts at schools as well. There is no point waiting until people have um, 
done their A-levels or BTEC or going into BTEC, you know, we need to be thinking about how do we engage with stage seven kids onwards, about thinking about creative careers coming into the media. I mean, if you look at the diversity of um, journalism, for, for example, it's still really, really poor. Um, I'm working class, single parent um, background, immigrant family, um, but there aren't many people like me, and in a city like Bradford, um, I don't see many people kind of um, in terms of decision making, whether it's in the media or in many other institutions. So if you want to build trust, people need to see themselves and to, to contribute to decision making. Um, I put race, class, gender, uh, everything matters. And the final is skills and training. Um, is really super critical, and if that is compromised, then you know where where are you? It's back to confidence, confidence of voice. Um, we were lucky to, enough to um, get some Joseph Roundtree funding to pilot, or actually to scope out a storytelling hub in Bradford. So we've put in a full application. We're a non-profit relying on charity money to do something meaningful in the north of England. You know, it matters to me because um, you know Bradford needs to lift up. But mm. it is, it, you know, in terms of sustainability, um, we could get one year of funding. Who would contribute to the second year of funding? Um, but that really matters, and it needs to be a follow through. It can't be skills and training at a certain age. It can't just also be um, HE either. Um, I mean, I agree, but. Um, yeah. Three of my kids have chosen different routes. Apprenticeships are a really good route. Um, BTEC, um, so you know, we need to think about how to build that post-16 joined up approach. Um, and um, back to, I guess, my final point is, if, if people are to trust economic decision makers, they need to know um, the human value of that. They need to feel invested in it. I mean, yeah. I joined my... Um, role at Five Live on the week of the EU referendum. And my editors, we, we're a very interactive station, my editors were saying that it, it will be vote leave. Um, unless, and everybody was really surprised, you know. Um, politicians were surprised, the media were surprised, but unless you have that connection with citizens, it's no point delivering any kind of economic plan or mandate. People need to trust you and need to hold to account and so back to the journalism I think yeah really should hold the space in Bradford. Very good, that was great and a really good diversity of um, issues we've covered. Right, time for some questions, well overrun because that's what's obviously happening. Um, you've got a guess. Not for the fun, you can run you need to go and save your grandchild. Uh, we don't want tears, we don't want tears or... But I want to be start with, the, we can do a poll, and this one's not going to get anyone elected. But, so, the, what we're discussing is how do you, um, particularly in West Yorkshire, how do we get growth up and inequality down? So let's start on which of those is harder? Which of those, which of those do you think is least either likely to happen or hardest to happen? Getting growth up or getting inequality down? I'm going to come on to why I'm asking a second. So who thinks getting growth up is the hard fit? You, don't, you can't say it's both, it's complicated. Right? <laughs> that's, life, life's not like that. Right. Two of you think the growth bit is the hard bit. Who thinks getting the inequality down is the hard bit? That is really interesting. Okay, I'll try and ask you another question. Is productivity below or above average in West Yorkshire compared to the country as a whole? Those that think it's above average? Nobody. No one, bold, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Who thinks the inequality in West Yorkshire is above the national average? See, at least lots of you are wrong on that one. Well, I know. what is the defining feature of the local economy? Lower productivity, but lower inequality. So let's go again. How sure are we that the getting the inequality down is the hard bit and getting the growth is up? Anyone change their mind? That's it, it's a good bit of self-reflection, but only one person out of 100. <laughs> <laughs> you don't win a comp, you know, politics is a long game. <laughs> yeah. Right, let's have some questions, that's enough for me, hang on with you. We've got some questions for these guys. None of you? Come on, winner. Gentleman over here, and we'll go one back. Give us your name as well, sir. Yeah, I'm Dave Stevens, I, uh, I work in Manchester, I live in, in Bradford, so I'm a 
transparent Northern powerhouse to us. And how's that, how's that going for you? Well, I missed the train after about an hour, and it's a diesel train. So yeah, uh, it'd, it'd be nice to have Crossrail for the North, it was promised. Um, I'm off tangent already. Um, <laughs> 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 um, bike lanes, bike lanes, just good bike lanes. Uh, now I'm back on message, there we go. Um, no, um, I think the challenge is going to be, given there's a, almost certainly going to be a change of government, you're going to have lots of mayors in the North, and you're going to have a Labour government in that mayor London. How do we get past Treasury brain? And how do we unlock the potential of the North? Because the politicians of the current government have been saying this. You know, we've had lots of Conservative governments saying, levelling up, saying Northern Powerhouse. Hasn't really happened. And then if we change the government in Westminster, how do, how do we get past Treasury Brown? Okay, great. Clear question. Yes. So, gentlemen at the back, and anyone else want to come on this round? Hands are leaving the door. Why don't we go in the middle? Then we can roll to the back. No, too late. Oh, okay, yeah, go. Thanks very much, Anne Dixon, Labour parliamentary candidate and hoping to be a Bradford MP. So, um, I'm I'm to available. <laughs> 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 are available. Uh, We're not really around here, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, Hannah, you in your slide said something about, you know, build on our strengths in terms of economic growth and services. We heard, though, that that is not necessarily where our strengths lie. We do have much more in the way of manufacturing. If we look to the jobs of the future and think about clean energy um, and so on, there is, I think, potential here within West Yorkshire and indeed within the Shipley constituency for us to be making things and to create good, uh, high-end manufacturing jobs. But one of the challenges I um, um, hear when I'm speaking to businesses in that tech is that they're not getting people coming out of our colleges and universities with the right skill set. So my question is, how do we join up the skills and learning investment that Tracy, as our mayor, wants to make our fantastic universities and colleges that we have here with the business opportunity of the future. Because for me, unless we do, we're not going to get the economic growth that right. benefits people. Great question. Yeah. I've put a jump on the back. He's got the entire pad open, which made me worry. Yeah. Short <laughs> question, sir. Uh, uh, so we've got two questions for you. One two. For you. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> and one for you, Cost. So the, for the mayor, almost a third of children in the country are living in relative poverty. So, do you have specific plans to address child poverty in the region? And the second question for you, Crossman, is uh, about your book. So, you have a very good uh, uh, 27th of June. <laughs> <laughs> Pre order it, you don't have to vote for it. So, I'm really excited to read it actually. So, Ex you can uh, keep going. It's <laughs> <laughs> such a no. soft <laughs> The title is very bold, like Great Britain, question mark, how we get our our future back. Get to the question. Get to the question. So, uh, the, the question is how simply, how how we oh, yeah, will get our future off. back, really. Okay, and you've got to write a book. Um, okay, good. Right, okay. Treasury brain, how are we going to remove it? And well, Tracy, why don't you take that and the child poverty? Straight away, yeah. So, Treasury brain, absolutely. I think we know that our colleagues in the Labour Party have spent 14 years waiting for this moment to get into government. And we are saying now's the time to hand over power and money and uh, budgets. That is why we have been working really closely with Labour. That's why we were there, all the mayors, talking to the Labour Party about how actually, imagine, think back to 1997 when Labour came in. They arrived, but they had to build the delivery of all of their promises. We are actually delivering, we're Labour in power, delivering already. We can turbocharge that delivery. Now, I think that is a, a really great proposition for a, um, an incoming Labour government. And also, when you get more growth, you know, uh, attractive investment, where there are mayors, I think to empower mayors makes so much sense. So, um, that single settlement that you've, you've seen in Greater Manchester and West Midlands, we are going for the level four devolution and then onto the single settlement. So, we can be more flexible with the money, you get more bang for your buck. I think Rachel um, is attracted to that as well. That if you can use the money more wisely, you get better outcomes, better growth, level up the whole country. Mayors have a solution for Labour. So um, it, it's exciting because it's also unprecedented. So it's, it's a great time to be alive and a great time to be a mayor. Um, just very quickly. But not a good time for child poverty. No, uh, child poverty. Um, actually, in some parts of Bradford, it's two thirds of children 
living in poverty, and it's absolutely shocking. I was a free school meal kid because I was a freelancer. My own kids were on free school meals. I know what it's like to be hungry in the summer, and I know how do you impact, how do you how do you solve this? We've all, we've struggled. Gordon Brown's got you know some great theses on it. I think what's really important is getting more money in parents' pockets. We have got to grow the economy in an inclusive way. And the, one of the most powerful tools is our skills. That's why we are having an innovative um, look at skills that are modular, that aren't three years or one year, that people can take a course that then can get validation into um, added to um, a, a you know, course that's of value in a profession, but also you know, working with um, our institutions to have boot camps where we can get people training. For example, if I may very quickly, just one example. Um, telecoms were telling us that they couldn't recruit. We had a course, 800 mainly men, far away from the work workplace, some with criminal records and so on. Nearly 90% went into work, really well paid jobs. I said, where's the women? So we ran a female only telecoms course. Those women were saying we won't do the course unless we can then pick up our kids at three o'clock, half three. So we extended the course for a week um, and shortened the day. Now, speaking to those women, so many of them, there were lots of single parents, and lots of them were in the care sector and in kitchens and catering. Now, I'm sad we've taken them out of the care sector, but actually, we have put them into well paid jobs. Their children have a better outcome. Very good, very good. Um, why don't you take um, recovery, manufacturing, and anything else from the cover? Uh, okay, I was just going to say something a bit more about um, Treasury on two fronts. Uh, first thing to say is we are in desperate need of fiscal reform, and I hope um, a Labour government will have the appetite for that. And the reason um, that hasn't happened is because it will be disruptive, there will be winners and losers. And But I hope if Labour has sufficient mandate, if you they have. You Labour government finance reform. Well, I do think fiscal reform, council tax and business rates, yeah, um, but there's not much headroom financially, but there are some critical choices to be made about the, how you distribute the taxes that you do raise. So I completely agree with Tracy also about devolution. The other thing for me is just an over, an, a, a proper overhaul of the Green Book, because the algorithm of assessment um, does not drive investment into upstream interventions that those prevent of you, Those of you demand. that don't spend your lives, this is, the Green Book is how we do our business cases for... It, it, for the Treasury, yeah, and it's that kind of, you know, magic black box, um, which it often gets superseded by political nicety. But, however, um, we are in Yorkshire actually doing some work with Treasury on reviewing the Green Book. And, of course, the Darlington campus has got to be an opportunity to do some cultural change with our Treasury colleagues, because the dead hand of Treasury officials should not be underestimated. So, I wonder if Shirley, who's at the back of the vice chancellor, would like to talk a little bit about the um, high-tech growth in the green manufacturing sector and other sectors. Because Shirley, you are, do you want to talk about the green manufacturing Do you want to? I can do. You are going to have to walk up here. What's the question again? Do I have to talk about... Are we going to have a green manufacturing boom, generally in the West Yorkshire, but ideally in Shipley specifically? <laughs> <laughs> hey, come in here, there's a microphone there. You can give us the answer. While you, there's a microphone there. Come on, come here. Oh, walk, walk. You're just so mm. Come on. Oh, over time. Seven minutes. Life's too short. 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 The answer to your short. question, short. sir, very briefly, is by the book, but what it tells you over many, many pages and many chances, how about we grow up and get serious about things that would actually make a difference rather than just saying things that make us feel better or saying well, if we're world beating, that'll make us world beating. So yeah. own up to some trade offs. And then one big thing. The one big thing is you're going to have to start being a country that invests in your future again rather than living off your past. Because in the end, we love yeah. our nice shiny buildings, but you've got to dig things up and build things if you want the country to grow. Green manufacturing. <laughs> okay, green manufacturing. Well, let, let's start off by saying we've got an amazing group of graduates that exit this university and all the universities in, uh, in, in, in Yorkshire, actually, the 12 universities. And working together, we're very, very clear that what we need is graduates who are on programmes that have been co-designed with employers yeah. to get those skills right. And I want to sort of put things right, really. We work with employers every day of the week in all of our universities because we know we can't do our job if we don't get it right for the employers. So turning to green, there's no doubt about it, manufacturing is changing. It's changing naturally, but it's also going to change deliberately. So we've got to have deliberate mechanisms put in place to make sure that our manufacturers can work with the knowledge economy that is produced from our universities to be able to 
uh, innovate, adopt and scale up in terms of how they are going to change the manufacturing. So when we think about um, manufacturing as dirty, you know, greasy, etc., it isn't. It absolutely isn't. But there's no doubt that we need in our area to maximise those manufacturers we've got in radio frequency, applied artificial intelligence, VR, XR, the creative industries, but more importantly, we've got to be able to put the arts and the cultural creative industries in the centre of this revolution, because the creative industries will help us to um, liberate their talent as well. So, yeah, there will be a revolution. It will be happening in the Air Valley. It will be happening in people. <laughs> Robotics, manufacturing. Bradford is the place to be for these, these, these businesses to plant themselves. Very good. Thank you very much. Right, two more questions, and then we're going to let everyone release you into the night. Let's do next. Uh, oh, 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 Come on, then. Is that both of you? Um, just wondering, uh, anyone can answer, uh, you've all mentioned different things that you think should be done, um, but just wondering what you see as the biggest barrier that you've faced so far to, to make that a reality, and what you think the biggest barrier will be after the general election um, to make that it happen. Good. Uh, yeah, mine was uh, a lot of the work that I do focuses on um, perceptions and employment perceptions. and. Uh, one of the biggest challenges often is trying to get people to move for work anywhere that is not the black hole of London, um, which sucks in a lot of that talent because it's very easy to go one tube stop down for a different job for a better opportunity. So how can we help overcome that barrier of actually getting to um, uh, being able to actually move somewhere where there is a network of jobs available? Great, very good question. Does anyone else want to come in? Otherwise, we're going to close the lady here, and then we're going to wrap up. Final question, so no pressure. That would be really good. <laughs> I don't know if this is going to be really good, but yeah, it's it's something that was on my mind after, I think someone asked about just young people, and I was just thinking one of the things that I know affects young people is family breakdown. And this can be caused based on like fiction or debt or you know, different factors. And I was just wondering, because I remember reading um, about one organization who was saying that sometime early this year was one of the busiest time entirely in their organization, in the wake of the whole Section 21 notice because of homelessness for young people. And I was just wondering, what exactly is the plan for, you know, particularly Tracy, in this, you know, new tenor? Great, very good question. And the, the record, like, Homelessness is at record levels right now. Child homelessness is at record levels, so that is a really great, um, that's a great question. Why don't, why don't you give us your, is it to make the biggest barrier thing really specific to you? What would be the biggest barrier to you being able to build a new room in, in, in West Yorkshire? Um, investment, really. I think the biggest barrier, the biggest opportunity is um, local journalism. And um, as a non-profit, you know, we rely on foundation funding, membership, we're free to air, um, but, it, but it's funding. And I'm not quite sure that the UK has a um, cohesive enough um, approach or um, a kind of organised enough approach to dealing with the problem of local journalism because everybody is a slight faction and has an interest. So I think that's the biggest barrier. And just to your point about, if I may, about um, jobs, infrastructure is the key thing. I mean, Media City was built in order to bring people in. If you can't get there easily or if you miss your train, there's no point having having um, kind of monoliths in certain places. When Leeds um, announced Channel 4, um, half their HQ coming to the city, um, which I still think doesn't have enough decision makers there, you know, we saw um, a growth of uh, indie, indie sort of, and I would say be really bold and creative about um, creating um, hubs, hubs that you can talent share, um, give people a, an understanding of the creative sector, build up, kind of, you know, think differently. Don't just think single organisation wide. How can sort of, you know, theatre get together with? Um, production and all kind of podcast companies, that's, that's I think, the way Great. to go is keep the talent up here. Right, Tracy, why don't you do, what's the biggest barrier you're going to face when there's a Labour government? It's too easy to see the nasty Tories. Mm -hmm. so where the, and then pass the hand, actually, you can give us what's the biggest barrier to this book happening. 
Look, the biggest barrier for me on both questions is transport. Yeah. So the biggest barrier to growth is getting people to jobs, to skills, to opportunities. But also the biggest barrier is going to be investment from the centre when the last time we invested in transport was you know, back in Victorian England. Yeah. So it's sustaining <laughs> the investment in mass transit, but also supporting mayors um, as they uh, bring buses back into public control. So transport's really important. And also picking up, picking up the rubble from what is being left by this government is going to be um, tricky. But also just to your point about homelessness, Honestly, it is so important. How can you grow an economy if you've got people surfing? surfing? And also, temporary accommodation costs local authorities an absolute fortune. It's eye-watering. Just think if we could use that money that we're spending on temporary accommodation, hotels and children, and it's shameful, growing up in hotel rooms for years, doing their homework on the bed for years, whilst they're waiting for accommodation. I've got to build more affordable homes. I've got to be free to do that. We've got to have the tools to do it. Great. Hannah, what's our biggest barrier to sorting out Britain? Um, well, I mean, I <laughs> <laughs> um, definitely all the things people said about investment. Um, uh, but I'm, maybe this is slightly cheating because I'm going to say something that people in our, some of our focus groups have, have brought up, um, which is that even though people kind of want, want you know, want investment, want growth, want reductions in inequality, people don't always trust that that is going to happen. They don't see it as kind of realistic. They, they don't always trust it in politicians um, to get it done. So I think that's uh, that's definitely a barrier that, that people see. So hopefully that's something that can be overcome yeah. when, you know, just drop. before the election or after the election and by yeah. local government too. Great. That's a great thing to uh, finish off because one of the things that in our focus groups, but you see it all around the country, is people thinking that because things have got so bad that they can't get better. It's not just, the problem is not just yeah. that things going badly have made things go badly, it's that people have decided they can't get better, they, they decide they haven't got better and therefore they can't get better, yeah. and then that leads them to them not trusting politicians even more. Yeah. And we get it in every focus group, right? we don't run focus groups on potholes, but potholes come up in <laughs> <laughs> And they come up not just because the people are angry about their car getting it's back on that day, it? it's a symbol that no one can be trusted to do anything. And so in the end, the actual task is to sort ourselves out again, start doing things, digging up a few roads and sorting them out so that people regain that trust and then keep doing that year after year after year and then one day, we're not a shit show, people. And that is what we need to achieve. Now, can we thank our panel for their thoughts today? Apologise to the five-year-old, apologies to you, have a lovely day, but also <laughs> go and sort the city out and then go and sort the country out, everyone. Thank you, I'm all by the book. Alright, buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do this one for free. <laughs>